It is my pleasure to introduce Nova Spivak, who is the producer, founder, CEO of Magical and ARC Mission Foundation and so much more. Uh, I am honored to be on the ARC Mission Foundation team. And Nova has a surprise talk. Nobody knows but Nova what it's going to be. So I say, let's let him get to it. I will say goodbye for now and Nova will take over. Take well, hello everyone, and and thank you so much, uh, Molly and Yannicka. Um, the conference is amazing, and it's really it's taken on global proportions. It's really actually kind of great that it's happening on Zoom, and so many people are watching. It's really cool. So thank you very much, uh, and also for all the kind words. Thank you very much. Um, so today, uh, Molly and I discussed uh, whether or not uh, I should talk about. Uh, some of the new things that the ARC mission is working on, which we haven't announced until now. Um, and also some of the history of why we're doing this, which also uh, really most people don't know. And I have only spoken a little bit about some of the things I'm going to say. Uh, so we figured, uh, why not do it here? And so um, that's what I'm going to do. So first of all, the history of the ARC mission starts uh, much earlier than most people know. Um, I wrote about it a little bit, but most people don't know about this. When I was eight years old, and this was like 1989, uh, I, I was given a, a gift. Somebody gave me a, a large blank book. It was like 900 pages or 1,000 pages of just blank. It was canvas bound, beautiful, you know, huge dictionary sized book. Um, nothing in it. And I loved that gift. I thought that was just the coolest gift. And I was always trying to think about what I would write in the book. And then I would do tests, like drawings or things on other pieces of paper and not mess up the book because I didn't want to have to tear out pages if I messed anything up. So I, I really thought this was a cool gift. Not long after I received it, um, you know, as an eight-year-old kid, I had a very unusual dream. Um, and this dream was kind of a Gulliver's Travels experience in which Although the dream occurred in, I don't know, an hour or some, you know, a regular REM cycle of a regular night. In that dream, I experienced many, many lifetimes, uh, like a hundred lifetimes of, of lives. And I actually lived them in that dream. And all I can say is it doesn't make any sense, but it's like I went out of our timeline into this other realm uh, and the story very interesting and it's it's why i'm doing the arc mission so i'm just going to tell you what happened because i remember it perfectly as if it really happened not like a dream but perfectly um so i'll give you the abridged version because the full version would take a long time but the abridged version is uh as an eight-year-old kid i have this dream um i wake up in in the body of an adult living in a you know i grew up in boston but i i wake up in the body of an adult living somewhere in california and, uh, and something is going wrong with the environment. And I'm working in technology um, and something's going wrong where there's now a prediction that we're gonna be entering a mini ice age of some sort. Something bad's gonna happen and it's gonna to have to do with the atmosphere. So um, the civil defense authorities in many nations had known about this for a long time and they had been actually making preparations secretly. Um, they had been preparing large underground civil defense like shelters. They were like little cities really um, in these northern areas of the planet. Um, and um, what happened was when this event occurred, uh, the, cl the sky got cloudy, like dark, not totally dark, but cloudy, very overcast. And the lack of sunlight started to cause rapid cooling of the climate. And very quickly, um, it started to become a very different environment all around the world. Um, and they could predict that it was going to get you know, very cold. And so they had to move people into these shelters, which they had been building. But the problem was that there wasn't enough capacity for everyone. And so they had to do some kind of a lottery to decide who could go into these shelters. And somehow in the dream, I was one of the people who was selected to, to go and so I was taken um, to one of these shelters and um, we ended up um, living in there 
And somehow on the surface, it was getting colder and then things kind of spiraled out of control and something happened that then caused, not only was it cold, but the air was even toxic. Some kind of a industrial accident or radioactive release, something happened where it wasn't just cold, but you literally couldn't even breathe the air. And so these cities, these sort of, they were cylinders underground and they were in this very cold area at this point. Maybe it looked, seemed like Alaska. Um, they had air filtration technologies at the surface. So there was like all of this sort of AC air filtration sensors, antennas and all this stuff kind of sticking out like the conning tower of a submarine sticking out of the ground. And then you go in and down many, many levels of hatches and airlocks. And you finally get into this underground city that can you know, literally I don't know, a thousand families in each one of these. And there were many of these in this big, big area. Um, they were, each one of them was like a big cylinder and there are many levels in each one. Um, so anyway, the air had to be filtered. Not only could you not live on the surface because it was too cold, but it was unsafe to breathe it. And so the air was being filtered and, and then the carbon dioxide was being pumped out. Um, so those of us in this underground situation, um, you know, we were all sheltering there, living there underground. And I made friends with all of these scientists and science and tech people. Uh, and we decided we needed to try to figure out if and when we could move back out to the surface. So we began to do an air sampling study where we, we actually measured uh, systematically um, air samples from the sensors at the top of these towers above ground um, every month. And we would plot all these different metrics to try to graph, you know, what was going on with the gases and whatever this toxic stuff was in the atmosphere and see if we could make a projection for whether it was ever gonna get better. And, and by, based on that, could we go back on the surface? So, so what happened was we, we did this study and we concluded after however many months we were doing it, that we could see a trend and that based on that trend in a year or two, um, we thought it might be safe for, for people to, to go back to the surface. Um, and so we told the authorities about this and they didn't want us to scare people or to raise false hopes. And so they really didn't want us to announce it and we kept it quiet. But as we got closer to that, the, the period of time when we felt it would be safe, we sent some people out to scout to try to find a location, not you know within walking distance where we could set up a, a, a habitat, sort of a base camp to start moving people out. So we scouted and eventually uh, many kilometers away, we located an area with um, hills and natural caves. And we felt like, okay, we could build a base camp in these caves. So we set up a sort of very rustic base camp there and we, we started bringing supplies and basic things out of the cylinders underground to this location, setting up, you know, trying to get rudimentary, you know, water purification, power generators and stuff like that. Then as we got closer um, to this period of time, it got a little bit more habitable, but still freezing cold and very difficult. We also found out that as the sort of as the atmosphere is warming up, our projections, our projections, our model showed that these cylinders were actually <laughs> sinking in the ground a little bit, like little by little, because like, apparently the, the ground that they were built in, it had been frozen, but now it was sort of becoming a little bit less frozen. And so the cylinders somehow were losing I'll, you know, they were sinking and, and at some point we could project that the, the um, air intakes were eventually going to go under and then there would be no way to get air in or out and anybody in there would be suffocated. So we told the authorities this and said, you know, we need to get everybody out by a certain date because, you know, we're concerned about the viability of these structures and they didn't, again, want us to scare people or raise false hopes, etc. So they basically said, don't tell anybody. So what we did is as we got closer to that period of time, we sent a group of people back and we tried to salvage as much as we could. Uh, things like medical supplies, tools, you know, electronics, books. Uh, and we also tried to get people to come with us. And we managed to get, get a few hundred people to come and we got you know, everything we could carry. And we, we took that stuff out to the habitat where, that we set up in this area in the caves. And sure enough, not long after that, um, what we predicted did come to pass and these structures went under and anybody who remained suffocated. So at that point, we were, as far as we knew, um, the last people alive on earth. We tried radio communications, but we couldn't pick up a signal. Nobody responded to our signals. So as far as we knew, we were the only settlement left. Um, and at that point, I was in the sort of 
last quarter of my life. Um, and, and all the people, um, that, you know, had gone in with us, um, we were all, you know, getting older and we realized that we, we were the last generation of people who had lived in the previous world before the event took place. Uh, and so we had grown up, you know, in a, in the civilization before where we had colleges and universities and we had, uh, you know, all this technology and computers and, you know, restaurants and cars and all that stuff. And, you know, we actually had that experience and we had, we remembered all of that. We didn't have really that many books. Most of that knowledge was just in our heads. And so we decided, since we're all getting older, that we needed to preserve that for future generations. Um, and so what we decided was a process where uh, one person initially would, would go and interview everybody and catalog literally everything they knew um, that might be useful to future generations uh, and put it into this book that we had, this big book, um, probably a series of books. But um, that first person was elected or volunteered, and that was me, and I was called the keeper of the book. So in that dream, I was the first keeper of the book, and I spent the rest of that life just interviewing everybody, everybody old, to get everything they knew and try to write it down. You know, and it was things like you know how to deliver a baby, um, you know how to build a well. Um, how to balance a budget or, you know, financial spreadsheet, you know, how to write software, whatever it was that they knew or specialized in was trying to capture it and build a kind of encyclopedia of knowledge, not just knowledge though, but also wisdom and experience, their stories, their, their families, myths, you know, everything they knew, um, which is a big task. So I spent the rest of my life doing that. And then I passed away. And then in the next life in the stream, uh, I was, um, the next keeper of the book who may have been related to me. And that person uh, then lived their whole life doing that. And then it went to the life after that. And that continued. And simultaneously, I saw the environment slowly getting better and, you know, the frost and the snow kind of going away. And it was now mostly, you know, green and the forests were coming back around this area. And then it accelerated through many, many, many lives. I mean, I think a hundred, it could have been more, I don't know but it accelerated where I saw them kind of whipping by super fast, um, just one after another, like like that, just coming past me. And um, each in each one, I was still doing that role. I was, the, I was the keeper of the book. And what I saw was that the civilization that we rebuilt um, because of this tradition that we had of interviewing everybody, uh, it sort of was oriented around this idea of journaling and everybody capturing their knowledge throughout their whole life so not just the oldest people, but now everybody would do that. It was like a ritual, a, a periodic thing where you'd come in and you would, you would sort of share what your experiences were or the wisdom that you had or whatever you had learned or whatever you wanted to pass on. And this was just something that everybody did. And so it became a kind of a knowledge and also memory oriented society where that was an important focus of just part of what we did. It was like, almost like a religious ritual, although it wasn't religious in any way. It was just a thing we did, um, almost like, you know, when I think about Native American tribal meetings, you know, where people share their experience and there's a kind of a group bonding experience, we would kind of do that. But it was around people's experience and wisdom and pres preservation of this. And the, the whole idea was to pass it down for future generations, um, as well as the experience of doing it, or the, the kind of learning experience of doing that. You know, it's an interesting experience to, to try to express what you know or, your, or to tell your story. So there was that bonding, but also there was this uh, altruistic intent to benefit future generations. So um, that just continued and continued. And eventually the way the dream ended was that um, I kind of, um, I was like gliding along the forest floor and I could see the pine needles kind of going by me and I could see like the trees up ahead and then up in the distance, it was dusk and I could see like these glowing lights. And as I got closer, I could see, oh, those, that's that hillside with those same natural caves that I remember in a unique layout on the hillside. And I saw one of them, oh, that's the cave that I originally lived in. And then I went closer and then I could see in that cave, it was like glowing warmly, you know, with light, like from candles or lanterns or something. And I could see there was a, there was this person, a guy um, sitting there at a, at a table writing, you know, he had a beard kind of like me, um, but big beard. And he was, he was writing in this book and behind him, uh, his wife was, was doing something. I couldn't tell what, but she was doing something and they were just both there, very harmonious, happy. And they were just, you know, 
that's what they were doing. He was writing in the book and I got closer and closer and closer and then it ended and then I woke up. Um, so that's the abridged version of the deal, the, the dream, sorry. And, and I remember really every little detail, um, like photographically of everything in that dream. And I've always remembered it my whole life. Um, and, and every time I tell it, I, I'm seeing it. As I'm telling you, I'm literally, I'm seeing everything that happened in that dream. So it's just like, it's burned into my memory. I don't know why. Um, and I never really knew what it meant or what I, I didn't know what to think of it. And when I woke up as an eight year old kid, after having that dream, I didn't really think it was so extraordinary because I didn't know that wasn't possible. I was like, wow, okay, what was that? Okay, well, next, you know, on to the next thing. But I still remembered it. And when I got older, you know, I ended up working in tech and doing all these knowledge related companies around data and knowledge management, the semantic web and search and, and so on. Um, you know, bits and pieces started to make sense. And I started to understand and recall like, wow, okay, now that kind of corresponds with this. So then uh, later in my life, I got interested in preservation um, as I got interested in the Wikipedia and, and I learned about just the fragility of our, war, of our civilization's knowledge, which is encoded in plastic, basically, and paper. Um, you know, it's extremely ephemeral. And I, I never had really thought about that. But as I learned about that more and I was exploring this concept of how to preserve knowledge, which I got interested in because of the stuff I was doing, I realized that. Uh, as I made a real deep analysis of it, that the media just does not exist to really store our civilization's records for more than maybe a thousand years at best. Uh, you know, paper is actually more durable than plastic in some cases, um, but it doesn't last that long. And if, you know, it's very, very fragile if it's exposed to moisture, for example. Um, all of our magnetic and media, of course, we all know how that decays. As far as optical media like DVDs and CDs, well, they, they oxidize and they get pits in them over time, about 10 year life sh shelf life. There's some other special forms of these like M discs, which have a polymer layer. Um, and that polymer layer, sorry, the, I'm sorry, the ceramic layer, that ceramic layer lasts longer and maybe even a thousand years. However, the, um, the organic matrix that it's in, which is plastic doesn't. And so when that falls apart, the ceramic layer falls apart. And so you, it's not, not, it's not clear you could really read them even after a hundred years. So what else is there? Um, so I started looking around to try to find a technology that could preserve our civilization's knowledge. And we also started thinking about where to do it. And that's the time when I, you know, I met people like um, Nick Slavin and eventually um, Matt Hurl and, and Robert Jacobson and some of my other collaborators and eventually Molly and, and Yannicka and others um, where we came up with this crazy idea but why don't we try to preserve civilization's knowledge on the moon because it's an off-site backup. Um, and it's a place that if there ever is an advanced civilization on earth in the distant future, they'll eventually go to the moon and they'll find it. Um, and then when we started thinking about that, uh, what should we store? We came to the conclusion that we should start with the Wikipedia because it's broadly curated and we can add all kinds of other stuff, but the Wikipedia, at least every topic is in there, whether right or wrong, whether you agree with the coverage, it's there. Whereas, you know, if you just take Britannica, it's only the official story. It's not the unofficial story of everything. The Wikipedia really is everything. So the idea was let's store the Wikipedia on the moon. So we started looking for technologies that could do that. And as well as all the normal issues that you have with oxygen, if you're trying to store stuff on earth, storing stuff on the moon is even harder because of the harsh environment. And so the long story short is we found these special technologies, to, uh, first, first quartz crystals. And then after that, later, nanofish and nickel. And we found a way to write knowledge into these. And ultimately we, we launched them into space first with Elon Musk, where we launched um, this quartz crystal with the Isaac Asimov Foundation trilogy. And we shot it at Mars, we missed. And now it's, instead of hitting Mars, it actually turned out to be good. It's now orbiting the solar system, the sun, I should say, for at least 30 to 50 million years, maybe longer, but the math can't, can't tell. After that, the math is too imprecise, but at least 30 million years, let's say maybe 50, making it the first library in space and also the longest lasting library in human history um, because three books is a library. After that, um, we then landed a 30 million page library on the moon with Space IL um, etched into nickel, nickel nanofiche. Um, and that's analog layers where you can literally see it in a microscope, you don't need a computer. Um, and then beneath those are digital layers. And we teach you everything you need to know in the analog layers to build the computers to get the digital data. And I can go, I could, I could speak for hours about what's on that, but there is actually a 30 million page library called the Lunar Library. It's on the moon now. 
uh, space AL spacecraft bear sheet, which means in the beginning crashed. However, this object was a solid piece of metal and stronger than a black box. And everything we know about the crash indicates it wouldn't have destroyed it. Uh, so it's there. Um, and some lost on the moon, but it's there. Uh, somewhere in Mare Serenitatis, which you can see if you look at the moon, it's the middle crater, the big kind of circular grayish crater. There's three of them that you can see, big ones, really like continent sized. It's up there in the upper uh, kind of quadrant, left quadrant of that, it's in there. So you can see the lunar library is there. And on that is the records of humanity, a 30 million page library, including the Wikipedia, 30,000 books, um, many huge resources on the world's languages, both at the, the living and lost languages or languages in danger of being lost um, and a massive amount of culture, art um, and, and vaults that individuals contributed such as David Copperfield who put all of his magic trick secrets up there in a vault. Um, and allegedly um, it, the story has been told that there may even be some tardigrades um, and uh, cells or material DNA from, from humans in it as well. I can really neither confirm or deny it. I believe that that stuff is there, but the way that we potentially added it um, is such that even we cannot be sure. Um, there's a very reasonable chance that there is, but there's also a chance that there isn't. So it's sort of Schrodinger's tardigrades, essentially. Um, that was a little last minute signature or Easter egg, a signature of earth. The idea was to just in the epoxy resin that held these discs together, we, we just put a tiny bit of um, material, although, we still cannot be sure that actually any tardigrades were there. Um, we essentially flipped a coin and we're not sure if they actually got in, um, which was intentional by the way. Um, so we really don't know if there ever were, um, but we think there were, we tried, but we might've failed um, or we might've succeeded. And so um, potentially there are tardigrades on the moon or potentially there aren't, um, but there definitely is a 30 million page library um, sitting there and it will be there for four to 5 billion years. So that's the story of the ARC mission. On our, our next mission, uh, we'll be going back to the moon uh, with Astrobotic uh, at the end of 2021, if everything goes on schedule, and we will be taking a million people with us, and that we call Luna. Oh, Nova, there is no one like you in the world. Thank you for opening our eyes to a future that we can't even contemplate and for all that you're doing to back up humanity's most important knowledge. I know Yannicka and I are really proud uh, to help you with that mission and, um, and, to, and to acknowledge that everyone's talk today is, is important knowledge and it will be on its way thanks to you. And we will be mission. taking the, the transcripts of everything in, in today's event yeah. with us to Luna when we set up uh, Luna, which is the beginning of the first city on the moon. Oh, thank you. Thank you so Hi, Nova. much. We have an interesting question from the audience here, uh, which I know you can answer. It says, um, what about DNA as data storage? Yeah. Are cells, you, can we use ourselves as a USB, basically? Yeah. So we actually, it's one of the early things we investigated. Um, first, I was, first, I was hoping that it would work and that our cells would be a storage mechanism. And then I, my first question was, well, is there already an encyclopedia in our DNA? So we started looking for that. And we went to lots of researchers and labs to see whether or not we could, you know, in the um, what's called the non-coding DNA, the junk DNA, if, if maybe there was a hidden encyclopedia in there. Um, and the answer is there is, there is evidence of patterns in there that may, that have similarities to linguistic patterns, but that doesn't mean that there's language in there. It could just mean there's repeating patterns using the syntax of chemistry and the molecular syntax of DNA, but it's not random. That's for sure. Um, it's not random in a way that's similar to language. Um, so we don't know if there's a, if there's an encyclopedia in our DNA, but I will say since the junk DNA region is not uh, maintained through natural selection, anything that you put in there would eventually degrade unless it has a selective advantage. So we, we don't think it's, it's not likely that there's a messenger or a signature in there. Uh, however, uh, we, we did start looking at DNA as a storage medium. And so it turns out synthetic DNA that is manufactured with error correction specifically for the purpose of storing data is an excellent way to store huge amounts of data. Um, and it's also a way to cheaply replicate that data. And so uh, working with many partners, including uh, Microsoft Research, um, but also other partners, um, we, we've been developing technologies um, to uh, store 
massive amounts of data in, in DNA. Um, and eventually okay. we, we hope that we okay, can put some um, DNA storage as uh, well. That's because they're not clicking hey, Molly. on that little thing. Can uh, Molly. One of Molly, we can hear you. There we go. Uh, and Yannicka, I think we lost you there. But um, anyway, the answer is it is possible to store DNA, uh, uh, store knowledge in DNA. And um, I think that will be one of the important storage media of the future um, within the next uh, 10 years. And a company, one company we work with closely is also called Catalog. And they've made an excellent scalable system um, for storing knowledge in DNA. And we actually wrote the Wikipedia into DNA with them um, last year. No, but we'll, uh, we can't possibly thank you enough uh, for your time today. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording now. Uh, that was amazing. Um, I know you have a lot of important work you're doing, so I better let you get back to it, Nova. Thank you. This was so special. Thank, Thank you, you so much.